Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NISPQ show. So uh, today's guest is um, an Algerian physicist, an entrepreneur, scholar, and the maker of the first automatic and fasted, fastest uh, automatic book scanner, uh, Professor Lotfi Belkhir. So welcome, Professor Lotfi Belkhir, to the show. And um, yeah, how are you doing? Good, thank you, Asma. It's a pleasure to be here. The pleasure is all ours. Thank you. So how so, are you doing, yeah. Professor Vulcher? I'm good, thank you very much. Um, everything is okay so far, thank you. And how are you? I'm doing great. It was a bit of a, a busy, busy week, but it's fine. Excellent. What about your week? How was your week? I can't remember a non-busy week for the last, I guess, uh, 20 years. So even this summer was crazy busy. Somehow it just gets worse with the age, I guess. Yeah, so it, you, you've, you've had uh, 20 busy years. Well, I would say a little more than that, but it's just getting busier. So my memory doesn't go farther back than 20 years, I'm afraid. So, <laughs> but, uh, but it's all good. I kind of thinks that uh, keeping busy keeps you uh, sharp. And um, so that's, uh, that's, I guess, the, the good side of it. Yeah, that's life. Uh, Professor Lotfi, I sense a New Yorkian accent in your new, am I right? You're dead on right, Asma, yes. I, uh, I learned English in, uh, in Long Island, New York. I did my master's and PhD there. So my first seven years, in fact, in the United States, um, what I went with very, very little English uh, happened in New York. So if there is, I guess, uh, the Algerian version of New Yorker accent, I guess. Okay, good. And which university did you study in? So I went to Stony Brook University, uh, which is uh, based in Long Island, New York. Long Island is kind of an extension of New York City. And uh, when I went there, I went there to study physics and uh, Stony Brook University was uh, ranked back then in the top 10 uh, physics departments in the United States. Mm -hmm. And how did you end up in Stony Brook University and why physics? Why not another major? Well, kind of because physics was the first love of my life. Uh, my wife doesn't like to hear that when I say that. But uh, so I, since the grade eight, uh, I knew I was going to be a physicist and I was dreaming to do my PhD in physics in the United States. So it was a kind of a dream come true. Mm -hmm. And I uh, did my bachelor or like call it DUS, uh, Diploma de Superior in Algeria. So I did three years in CTIF. And then I did uh, the last year specialization in theoretical physics in University of Abu Zawar. Uh, University of Science and Technology at Hawaii Bermudian. And then I was one of the four um, graduates in physics that uh, were lucky enough to get a scholarship to the United States. And so when you, when you traveled to the United States to study there in Stony Brook, you spoke on barely no English or your English was already good? No, my English was awful. Um, all I knew was a uh, lot of French, a uh, little bit of Arabic. Uh, I've never been very good at Arabic. In fact, my Arabic improved after I went to the United States and interacted with all the Arab speaking folks there. Uh, English was, uh, I was very bad in English when I was in high school and junior high as well. And I started studying a little bit of English when I knew I had a scholarship to go to the States. Uh, but that didn't work very well either because it was summer and uh, so uh, I remember I went to uh, uh, Engl uh, English as uh, second language school. It was uh, in a small college uh, university in, uh, called CW Post University, also in Long Island. And uh, this is when I got to, I guess, level three or level four out of nine levels of English. Uh, but there was um, a lot of motivation because um, Instead of sending us in June uh, of 1986, which is when I graduated, they sent us in January of 1987, and we were supposed to get an admission in a good school by September. Uh, we didn't know that admissions actually at the good school closed by April of 1987. Mm -hmm. 
And so we had to uh, do our TOEFL and we had to do our GRE, which is tough even for, uh, for Americans, and get good enough scores to be able to actually get to the good schools we wanted to apply for. And uh, so uh, we were studying like 16 hours of English a day. And uh, what's amazing is that within a month and a half, I started dreaming in English, which was kind of the trigger point for me that I knew I was on the, on the right track. So I remember I did the first TOEFL exam. I got um, 570, 570. Uh, the, it was the old TOEFL. So the top score was 770. Not sure, I got 490. And the minimum score they accept you in the university was 550. But if you wanted to go to the, one of the top schools, you had to have more than 600. The maximum score you can get was like 670 points. So the first one was like 470 or 490, it was way below the bar. And then within the month, I took it again and I got scored 620. So it was a good jump. And of course, we're studying to the G for the GRE as well, which had much more difficult English. And then there was the math and there was the analytical section. So we were uh, breathing and living English in and out. And That's how was it. how was the experience in general studying in the U.S.? I mean, start the beginning and then getting used to a new culture and the shift because you were studying in French and then everything you knew in French suddenly is now in English. How was the whole experience? Yeah, so realizing that the language in which you studied all your life becomes suddenly completely useless. I mean, French is like the romance language for Americans. Oh, you speak French, how are you? And merci beaucoup, and that's it. And then, of course, and, and Americans are notoriously known of knowing nothing but English. So you had nowhere to get by by any other language. And, uh, and so it was, uh, it was a shock in so many ways. Uh, the language, of course, uh, that we knew were completely useless. The culture was different. The school system was completely different. Uh, and I remember when we landed in JFK, the school sent us a limo, a stretch limo, to bring us to CW Post. This was January 5th. And we're like, wow, what is this car here? And we're all around in the big uh, living room and we're opening the fridge and finding all those uh, bottles of liquors and drinks. Can we drink this? Oh, there is a TV, can you turn it on? And then it was January 5th. So it was just after the new year. And as we're going to Long Island, Long Island is such a beautiful place, big houses and so on. They were all lit up with the uh, Christmas and New Year lights and so on. So, wow, this is America. Look at this. So it was totally a uh, cultural shock in a good way. And then we realized at the end when we got to the school that we had to pay for the limo. It was not mm -hmm. like a gift. <laughs> so, so we started collecting money. I mean, the school was nice enough to send us a limo. They just didn't tell us that it was not at their... Uh, at their cost was ours. So we got hit with the American culture, like, yeah, I invite you for food, and I, but you have to pay for your own uh, plate uh, kind of thing. And then uh, the guy, the director of the school who was away, he said, you also have to give him a tip. In Algeria, the tip culture isn't there. So we had to, again, pull off all of our cash and find $7 a year, $5 there. But it was fun, it was kind of new and it was, uh, so, but that was, everything was new. Everything was kind of a shock. And, uh, and then we go into this dormitory, which is of course co-ed and say, okay, wow, there are boys here and girls there and where's the separation and completely mixed, of course. So uh, it was just like one hit after another, but we were young, we were all excited and we just keep, kept on taking it on. And, uh, and that was really part of the learning experience. Yeah. And what was the most challenging part of the experience? I don't know if there was one challenging part, but um, I would say the challenging part was, um, was communication. Mm -hmm. Was uh, how do we get ourselves, um, how, how do we sell ourselves? How do we uh, succeed in this environment? How do we behave? Uh, 
we were so young, we didn't know the difference between simulation and integration. We didn't know where to draw the line between uh, our identity and our culture and the new culture and new learning that we were bringing. And that line, of course, nobody could tell you where to draw it. It was kind of your choice. And, uh, and that was probably the toughest part to do is uh, where, where do you end and where does the learning start? Uh, and how do you negotiate that? I guess that's a challenge that, uh, that is the, the most difficult for a newcomer, but it's a challenge that just goes on and on as you try to learn and as you try then to go into the professional work and, uh, and assert in yourself, but at the same time, uh, influence and allow yourself to be influenced. And again, be able to discriminate between the good and the bad uh, the cultural and uh, and the um, and the non-cultural, and, uh, and and I guess that's uh, that's I would say a challenge that uh, goes and spoken very often, but in many ways probably the the toughest part. And it it applies to everybody. It applies to everything, whether relationships or food or uh, uh, or behavior or what have you. I remember the first breakfast we had in the cafeteria of CW Post. So in Algeria, the, your breakfast is hot milk with a little bit of, of strong coffee. Mm -hmm. And we went around and there was no hot milk at all. And we saw the opposite, people filling up their mug with this light American coffee and putting a little bit of milk. So when we put all of the milk and a little bit of coffee, it was ice cold. So that was not the cafe au lait that we we're used to. Uh, the coffee was terrible. I mean, this was back in the late 80s. There was no Starbucks or strong coffee or espresso. It was all this watery coffee that was tasteless, uh, but that they drink by the 64 ounces or the, or the half liter uh, three times a day. Uh, the bread was also kind of, there was no baguette or no whole wheat bread. It was all the sliced uh, wonder white bread that just felt like paper and was all porous. So, um, the, the, so for us, the food was terrible. And uh, it, it had to take until I guess the 90s and so on until we start seeing wholesome bread, uh, good coffee, um, the good kind of cheese and what have you. So the food uh, was always a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. And as Muslims, of course, we wanted to buy halal meat. So we had to look around and ask and so on. And there were very few stores that you had to Travel to Jamaica and to New York and uh, to, to New York City, Jamaica and New York City, to actually buy some halal meat. And uh, but it was all fun. Uh, it was um, all kind of uh, exploratory, and, uh, and that was, uh, I guess, that's how we took it. Yes, and I guess that was in the in eighty seven, right? Mm -hmm. I think now with social media and internet it's a bit easier to overcome such challenges because you can, I mean, you can chat with your family at any time. You can, I mean, Google anything you want and you find everything. I mean, what can yeah, you tell was, someone? Was, was, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, so one of the difficult things was communication with our family. So mm -hmm. uh, it was the time where we wrote letters between my dad and myself and my mom used to write letters. And then uh, I used to, it was used to cost $9 a minute to call back Algeria. And you had to put all these quarters in there and then you keep on throwing them while you're speaking. And of course, you couldn't uh, talk for more than two or three minutes and then you go broke. So it was a very different time indeed. Yes. And if anyone who's watching, someone who's watching now and he's in the US in an exchange program or a scholarship or, and he's facing such challenges or different challenges and he's thinking of maybe coming back, maybe giving up the scholarship, what can you tell them? I say that is the most terrible mistake that you'd make. Uh, mm -hmm. If anything, things I think got a lot easier. Uh, now that, uh, like you said, you have Zoom calls, you have free communications, WhatsApp, and so on, but you also have a lot more diversity uh, in the States. I mean, the States has always been a melting pot, uh, but today it's even more of a melting pot, and that diversity is, uh, it has asserted itself in so many ways uh, that uh, the cultural shock is a lot less than what we had to deal with. 
-hmm. But I would say also it's um, uh, it's it's you're quitting on a, on a very important challenge that's actually going to be transformative and is going to make you really a much better and much stronger uh, person with much broader horizons. So we have Leila is asking us, do you feel now culturally adapted or are you still struggling? No, actually I, I feel uh, my experience in the States and then later when I started my own company where I got to travel a lot more, uh, I feel like I am kind of a very international person where I can adapt, not only adapt, but build relationships uh, wherever I go. And when I say wherever I go, I mean in very different cultures, whether Asian cultures or uh, Middle Eastern or, um, or European. Uh, what I, so my, my experience in this multicultural uh, environment has taught me that we as human beings, uh, we are extremely similar in so many ways. And, uh, and we, that in, in ways we don't realize it because as we grow up in one single country, we get conditioned to those stereotypes that we start really believing on that are actually completely false. And it's only when you leave this country and you live there for many years and you get to develop relationships with people who you thought were completely different from you, but you realize we're in so many ways all the same and, uh, and, and those stereotypes essentially uh, get completely shattered. And uh, so, and this, not, as I said, happened not only when I was in the States, but got even more reinforced when I started my company. And I started to start traveling to China, to Japan, to Europe, Middle East, to uh, Latin America and so on. And I was building relationships. I was being myself uh, or my new self, as you would say. And I did not have to change my behavior or change the way I talk or change the way, the, the change my beliefs and still found people who resonated with that and built trust the relationship. And this is when you realize all those stereotypes are completely wrong uh, in most of the cases and that it's, uh, we're so similar. And that I think is very important because it allows you to build bridges. It allows you to create uh, business ventures, create relationships that are mutually rewarding. And, uh, and that I think uh, is a very big uh, step towards bridging uh, um, between people, between the country, between countries and creating uh, mutually rewarding relationships, whether it's in business or in any, in any other field. Mm -hmm. That's a very beautiful message from you, Professor Lotfi Bulkhir, and that's what we do in PD, people to people, and bridging the gap between people and trying to reinforce uh, bilateral relations, and we try to bring people near to each other, and that's a very beautiful message from you. So you mentioned that you've started, you, you started your own company. I want to know how did you move from a physicist to, enter, to an entrepreneurship? That's a very good question. So uh, I finished my PhD in 93. Then I did a postdoctoral uh, fellowship in the University of uh, Bloomington, Indiana, in the Midwest. And I uh, was working with uh, two very distinguished professors. Uh, one is at Yale and one is at uh, uh, Texas University. And I was working on a fascinating field uh, called the fractional quantum hall effect. It uh, was fascinating to me because it was something that was really, really unique. We were discovering new particles that uh, nobody knew existed. But at the same time, if you ask a group of physicists today and ask yeah. them, do you know about the fractional quantum Hall effect? Probably only 10 or 20 percent would exactly be able to answer that question. So that tells you a little bit how esoteric it is and how, uh, in a way, it's uh, still 50 years later, no, no physicist can think of any application uh like of this particular uh, fascinating physics so at that point it dawned on me that uh did i want to continue down this field that i love that i'm pretty good at but working on a subject that maybe only 15 or 20 people around the world cared about in fact we knew each other by first names <laughs> or did i want to do something that's actually a little more impactful mm -hmm. and so it was a decision 
uh, point of whether I want to pursue something that I love, that excites me, or something that would serve a purpose, but that's maybe less exciting at the individual level. And I never thought I would actually have to come that choice. I've always, I had always decided that I'm going to be a physicist for the rest of my life because that's what I love doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, it was no. The decision was, I want to do something that actually serves a purpose that's bigger than just what I love doing, that's bigger than me. And this is when I decided to pursue. Uh, so I didn't want to move to business. I wanted to move to industrial research. Mm -hmm. So research that would actually have an application to products. Uh, never wanted to do business, never liked business. Uh, I never thought that I would be teaching someday business and practicing it. So, uh, so it wasn't planned at all. So I decided to apply to, as a research scientist, to join Xerox. Uh, that was the only application I did. And I got in. And I was a uh, uh, senior scientist uh, as I started. I got paid three times more than I was doing what I was doing as a postdoc. <laughs> and uh, I was the envy of actually a lot of other theoretical physicists who graduated from Stanford who couldn't get a job like that. So it was, um, it was good for a while. I went and did some research that was uh, solved some tough problems and uh, zero graphic uh, technology, Xerox. And then I had the same, uh, same kind of revelation is that uh, I saw researchers in the R&D who were there for like 20, 25 years, had like 30 patents. But when I asked them, what kind of products did you develop? And they would say, we don't do products here, we do research, we publish papers. And they were actually scientists inside Xerox, which was uh, a corporation. So I said, okay, I did not leave physics to do some other kind of low level research. I mean, I was at the very kind of cutting edge of research and I wanted to search. So I moved to a product company, to the product division of Xerox and worked on an actual product. Again, it was uh, fascinating for a while and then we solved all the problems and now what? And it kind of become boring again. And then I decided, okay, I realized that it was not the engineers and the scientists who are actually making the calls on what to develop. It was the managers who would decide what kind of products the scientists and the engineers have to work on. So I said, ah, uh -huh. so I thought it was the scientists who were making all the waves. Uh, so I decided, okay, what is this field of management? I need to learn about it because if they are the decision makers, I need to, I need to find out. So I applied for uh, an MBA and then I decided to do a master of technology. And then I started becoming fascinated about the question of innovation. What is innovation? How is innovation and invention are different? How do people make new products or make new companies that are based on new technologies? So um, that's when I started drifting to the dark force, as they say, of management. And, um, and so I, uh, at that point, they promoted me to another position that even doubled my salary it was in Palo Alto, California. And I went and I was assigned to the Xerox Venture Lab in Palo Alto, California. They didn't tell me that my cost of living was going to go by three times though. So, uh, but I was in Silicon Valley. I was a mile away from Stanford University. So it was kind of the heart of it all. And this is when I started working on, uh, on what makes innovation. So I started the process for radical innovation at Xerox, and then I started my own project, which was uh, to develop an automatic book scanner. Mm -hmm. And that automatic book scan project, initially, I wanted it to be within Xerox. I did not want to leave Xerox. Xerox had been a great company, great for me as well. And of course, it was a cozy job, good pay, and I did not have to leave the, the model ship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but however, after I built the proof of concept and showed that we could develop the first automatic book scanner in the world, uh, Xerox stock went from $60 to $4. They had the near death experience and decided to cancel all of the kind of blue sky ideas projects, including mine. So at that point I had the choice to either seek another job within Xerox, which they offered me mm -hmm. or leave and start my own company. Mm -hmm. So I was in Silicon Valley, there was a lawyer, Mario Rosati, who said, this is a great idea. Why don't you uh, leave Xerox and I start a new company and I'll help you. Oh, I thought, that's great. 
So this was June, 2001. I thought, okay, I'm in Silicon Valley. I'm gonna leave Xerox. I'm gonna start a company and I'm gonna meet with some VCs and get $5 million as, uh, as funding, right? Wrong. Um, I was in New York City on 9-11 of 2001 in Manhattan for a meeting with uh, John Newcomb, CEO of Simon & Schuster, was very interested in, uh, in funding our company. But the timing was the worst possible timing. This was September 11, 2001 at 10 a.m. in New York City. So, uh, so as I went into our meeting, the first tower had collapsed. And 10 minutes into our meeting, the second tower had collapsed. So there was uh, no book scanning or funding that we could talk about. We shook hands, we never met again. And I drove one way uh, trip on a rental car from New York City to San Jose. So this just gives you an idea of the, uh, of the environment I was in when I started com my company. There was no VCs. Uh, there was also the, uh, the, the, the internet bust. Uh, the market crashed, uh, the investors all went home essentially, were licking their wounds. And I was out there um, in the cold with, uh, with a family, with, uh, with a rent that was $2,500 a month and with no salary and no, uh, no employment. And I was essentially spending all of my savings into trying to push this company forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this was uh, also uh, very interesting, uh, very stressful, but uh, uh, very, very uh, um, rewarding challenge in a way uh, that um, entrepreneurs really have to show a very strong commitment and faith into their project. Still managed to get it funded, still managed to... Uh, to get the company and develop the, the product, which was very complex. And um, fast forward two years later, we got our first purchase order from Google for five machines, mm -hmm. uh, fully paid in advance at $100,000 per machine, which uh, allowed us to uh, get additional investors and then launch the company and launch our first product. It was a long, challenging path. It was long, but, uh, but it was also a thrilling, path and um, and uh, I would not have it any other way because mm -hmm. this is essentially what uh, made me who I am today yes. did you have of course did you have any uh, regret moments and how did you overcome them I don't think I would uh, regret it I think um, today I might not make that same jump in the dark, in the, in the unknown that I've done. Uh, and, I, uh, and I think this is something that's actually detrimental rather than helpful. And I always tell my students that uh, the most successful entrepreneurs are those who are naive and foolish enough to make those big jumps. And if I knew what I know today, I may not have made it. I may not have had the, that kind of courage to actually jump into the unknown uh, and that courage is kind of a mix of courage and, and foolishness as well. And how did you use what you learned from the U.S. in Algeria now? Yeah, very good. So, um, so after I led the company Kirtas for about 10 years, I divested myself. I left the company. Uh, I got pretty good at turning pages. So it was one more page that I turned. And I took a position. Uh, I've sorry, always just a been... question. Just a qu sorry to interrupt you, but sure. you mentioned the name Kirtas. Do um, right. you have any, I mean, why the name Kirtas? Why you chose this name? Does it have any? Yeah, that's actually a question that I always get from reporters. Um, and uh, so Kirtas has two origins. One is in Arabic and one is in English. So mm -hmm. the Arabic comes from Kirtas. Mm -hmm. Tas, which means paper or parchment. Mm -hmm. So like the very famous uh, poet, Arab poet says, Al-Khayl wal-Layl wal-Bayda'u ta'rifuni wal-Sayf wal-Rumh wal-Qirtas wal-Qalam. So he was bragging about himself, how he was, um, how the night and the, uh, and the 
and the horses and the, uh, and the, and the sword know him, as well as the parchment and the pen, uh, which is the Qatas. And, uh, and he was a great poet, but he was also a great fighter as well in the battlefield. And it was a little bit too full of himself as well. And uh, so, so that was the parchment. And kirtas in English is an anagram for at risk. So mm -hmm. it's scrambled at risk into kirtas. So together they mean all the books that are at risk of being lost if we don't digitize them. And so that's kind of the uh, kind of dual origin of the name itself. That's a very beautiful and a noble mission of the whole company. Thank you. Yeah, the, the company's mission was really to be a bridge, a bridge between the analog and the digital divide, uh, believing that as we digitize books, they also would bridge the digital gap, which is the ones that have access to those books and those that don't, mm -hmm. and be able to democratize knowledge. We kind of were seeing our Kirtas machine as the reverse of the Gutenberg press. The Gutenberg Press allowed people to put their ideas into books for dissemination. Yes. But in the digital age, that knowledge is captive of those books that are supposed to preserve it. And by digitizing them and making them available, we unlock all that knowledge from the books and the, uh, that bind it. Yes. You know, uh, there is this question that often occurs. I don't know if you've been asked this question before or not, but if you go in the past or you get the chance to travel in the past, which uh, characters or persons would you like to meet? And I always answer that Gutenberg, who's the one who created or invented the, uh, the printer, the first printer in the world. And that's because he made knowledge accessible to everyone. And because of him, we have all these books. And I believe now I... I met the Gutenberg of 21st <laughs> century. So okay. I, I'm lucky. <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, when you ask students today, say, when was the last time you went to a library to fetch a book? And I said, what? What's a library? And they think everything is available on Google. And uh, so if it's not on Google, it does not exist for them. And in my pitch, when I was, I was always thought that people, and this was back in 2001 already, and I said, people think that everything that exists is available on Google. They don't realize that less than 5% of the human knowledge is available on Google today on the internet. And the rest is still captive of those books. Yes, true. So back to the, uh, how did you use uh, what you learned from the US in Algeria? Right, so, uh, so after my experience at Kirtas, I moved to Canada. I was uh, recruited as the uh, chair of eco-entrepreneurship and a very special program at McMaster, uh, which was a master in engineering entrepreneurship and innovation. So it was a 20 month program that um, I was recruited into it and then eventually uh, become the lead of the program itself. I, uh, was able to transform it. And in 2016, uh, McMaster received the uh, Global Excellence Award in uh, Entrepreneurship Education by the International Council of Small Business and Entrepreneurship, which made McMaster the first and only, to this day, only uh, Canadian institution to receive this, uh, uh, this very coveted prize. So, uh, so I, I essentially am still working at McMaster, but I was there from 2012 to uh, 2021 when I took my sabbatical. And in 2019, uh, I was, as I was looking forward to taking one, one year of sabbatical, I said, okay, I met with uh, three friends and two professors, one uh, business uh, man to say, how about we bring something like this to Algeria? How about we bring innovation, entrepreneurship, education to Algeria, because we all realized this was the future. Uh, large companies, of course, Algeria is based as a fuel uh, dependent economy. And we know that oil and gas are not going to be there for our grand grandchildren. Even if the reserves are there, the world is gonna stop, hopefully buying uh, oil and gas because we're burning the planet. And the second of all, is that the jobs, the new jobs, whether it's in the US or Europe or China are not coming from large companies, they're coming from entrepreneurs, startups. 
and that uh, startups have diff need a different kind of skills. They, it's not MBAs and business schools are training managers for companies, established companies. They're not training entrepreneurs. In fact, they don't know how to train entrepreneurs. So mm -hmm. my experience both in practice in the United States through running that company for 10 years, I was the CEO, the chairman of the board. I was also the technical program manager and the eight years of pedagogical experience teaching uh, uh, entrepreneurship in a learning by doing approach kind of equipped me with this kind of skills uh, and vision that we can bring this to Algeria and in fact bring a better program, a better version of that program to Algeria to make it uh, create Futurist Institute that would essentially be the first institute of its kind in not only Algeria but all of Africa. And the idea there is to train uh, our youth to how to become successful entrepreneurs, technology-based entrepreneurs. And how is, how is it going with the in Futurist Institute in Algeria? Do you have so, your first uh, students and? Yeah, we are uh, midway on our first cohort of students. And uh, it sounds like they're very happy. They're very challenged. Uh, they probably didn't realize it was going to be this hard. Uh, but they're very motivated as well. And uh, we uh, also, this past summer, we launched the, um, the first Algerian edition of the Arab IoT and AI Challenge. Mm -hmm. So Futures Institute was the official uh, organizer of this nationwide uh, challenge. Uh, the top three winners will get to go and compete in Dubai uh, with 11 other Arab countries. And, uh, and this will give them great exposure to see what's going on. And the startups and the projects that are selected all are focused around artificial intelligence and internet of things. Uh, because again, we believe that those two fields are going to be major enablers in pretty much every industrial sector of the economy. So uh, we got essentially endorsed by the Ministry of Startups and the Knowledge Economy. And uh, we received very strong support. We had more than 500 uh, applicants, uh, more than 200 projects. Uh, there was uh, nationwide training in two major sites at the Econ Nationale Polytechnique in uh, Algiers and University of Asdim in Wurgla. And we had more than 200 other online participants across the country. So uh, this was the first in Algeria. I don't know of any other training. I was exclusively in English, uh, and, um, and we were really impressed by the quality of the participants. Uh, I remember at some point, a group of students said, uh, sir, can you please mix it up a little bit with Arabic and English so we can follow? And I said, okay, who wants to do that? And there was a big outcry. no, 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 stay with English, stay with English. So I said, sorry guys, the crowd is against you here. We're gonna stick with English. Uh, and, uh, but uh, overall, I think this was again a first because um, I know most of the training in entrepreneurship and uh, in all the challenges are in French or a mix of French and, uh, and Arabic, but we want to have our entrepreneurs have a global outlook. Mm -hmm. And today, uh, English is the language of business, innovation and entrepreneurship and is the global uh, language for communication. So uh, this is why we opted that English is going to be the primary uh, language that we use at Futurist Institute, and as well as for all of our trainings and challenges. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear this, that both uh, Algerians are both interested in English and in inter entrepreneurship. It's yes. very motivating and hopeful. So what is your advice to young entrepreneurs or people who want to be in this field? Yeah, uh, that's also a very good question. So Algerians in general have grown dependent on the government for everything, mm -hmm. from the primary education all the way to the university. And then very often they complain that the government is not giving them a job after they graduate. Mm -hmm. and, and that dependency um, is detrimental to the future of Algeria and to the future and to the character of our youth. So the, um, the, the, the key thing for Algerian entrepreneurs or any entrepreneurs to become successful 
A is to become self-driven and self-dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing that we've done, for example, for our students, initially we're going to do the training for free. And I said, no, we're not going to make it for free. We're going to make it for a nominal fee. So 2,500 dinars for in-person and 1,000 dinar for online. So which is equivalent of say, $5 versus $12 uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, for in-person. And some of my uh, uh, associates said, oh, this is going to turn them off. Nobody's going to show up. I said, well, look, if it's going to turn them off, these are not cut out for entrepreneurs. And because an entrepreneur has first to sacrifice and has to spend his own money and depend on himself in order first to attract uh, support. When I started my company, I had a very interested investor and then he told his name was Jim Nowak. And he said, Lotfi or Lofty, as you would call me, I want to put $50,000, but I'm not going to put it until you put your first $50,000 yourself. Mm -hmm. And I went out and borrowed 50,000 euros from my dad, Larahman, my sister. And, and I went and put that 50,000 euros. And then he smiled and said, here's my 50 grand. And then he put another $250,000 after that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that first pay to play and sacrifice from me, if you as an entrepreneur, you're not ready to sacrifice, to put your savings, to borrow money for your dream, why would you expect the government or investors to come and do it for you? So that change in mindset has to happen to our youth. Mm -hmm. And they need to understand that you need to first depend on yourself and be self-driven before you expect either the government or investors or anyone else to invest in you. Um, and, and, and that you see it very often in Algeria. I think uh, it's going to be changing, uh, hopefully. And we are one part of our role is to bring in that different mindset and different culture. And I think that's probably one of the most challenging things. If we're able to change the mindset and the culture, then the rest is, um, is technical, is easy. Very beautiful messages from you today, Professor Bulkhir. A wonderful conversation with you. Um, thank you very much for being with us. Um, I can't agree enough with you. Uh, so thank you very much for our audience, for listening. That was a wonderful conversation. I can't really, uh, I mean, it's very beautiful. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. And stay tuned for our uh, next episode on next Wednesday, inshallah. And yeah, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Asma. It was a pleasure as well. And the pleasure is all ours. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.